So let's remember where we, where, where we left off in the last lecture. Um, I had reminded you that the Schwarzschild black hole could be written uh, as follows. Schwarzschild black hole and Kirchhoff coordinates, and was a very complicated way of writing uh, a very familiar metric. The point of this rewriting was that the same metric, again, okay, that we would we now decided to look not at the Schwarzschild black hole itself, but an infinite parameter class of metrics. Okay, uh, and the generalizations that we decided to look at was matrix in which rho was not this particular function, but any function. And u mu was not this particular one form field, this constant particular constant one form field, but any one form field. Uh, However, we require that u was tangent to surfaces of constant rho. <coughs> that is, n dot u is equal to 0, where n is the normal to surfaces of constant rho. OK? Um, we decided to look at this class of metrics. And we found something sort of interesting about this class of metrics in the large delimit. Um, but before we reviewed that interesting thing, uh, now that we have a little, we have a little less press for time than we were in the last, in the last minus five in the last lecture, uh, let's look at this metric um, a little more calmly. Okay, so the first thing I want to do, um, so suppose now I've got this metric, and now in your mind you're going to get rid of this identification of this piece. Okay. Rho and u are just any function and any one form. Okay. And I want to look at certain properties of this metric. So the first property that I already mentioned in the last lecture was an obvious one, but uh, that's, uh, we should write down. This is when rho is greater than, in fact, rho minus 1 is much, much greater than 1 by d. This metric reduces to flat space. OK? For instance, if rho was 1.1, then this one term here would, would be e w nu plus 0. So it would just be flat space. And you can check more carefully that uh, uh, this thing exponent, that if rho minus, that if rho minus 1 uh, is equal to alpha by d, then this whole metric decays to flat space like e to the power minus alpha. So if alpha is much more greater than 1, this metric decays to flat space. Okay. So I said that rho was absolutely any function, but let's let's uh, uh, let's be more specific. Let's be I mean uh, let's be more honest. Rho is a function that is taken to grow towards infinity, becomes one somewhere. The place where rho becomes one is totally crucial. Okay? And then becomes less than one somewhere. Now, uh, the kind of space time that I have in mind is something like this. I've got a tubular surface. That represents some space like manifold, some time like co dimension one sub manifold. That is an allowed world volume of a co dimension one object. Okay? This world volume needn't be, you know, on spatial slices, needn't be simply connected. I can have two of these. I can have one going here, one going there. So suppose I had uh, the row configuration corresponding <laughs> to this situation would be rho greater than one here. Rho less than one here. Rho less than one here, rho greater than one here. Rho greater than one here. And this rho, as we go to infinity, we go to infinity. I'm looking at rho functions like this. 
One could be replaced by two, could be replaced by ten. But that should answer us. Okay? So, in this situation, what have we seen? Okay? What, what have we seen? We've seen that in apart from a little region of thickness 1 pi d around the rho equals 1 manifold, on the outside, the places where rho is greater than 1, our solution is plasma. constant row 
is null at the surface rho equals 1. What this tells you is that the surface rho equals 1, the submanifold rho equals 1, it's a very special kind of submanifold. So it's called a null manifold. It's a manifold. Yeah. Uh, so rho equals 1. study of general relativity for many reasons. One of which is that there is, in the study of black hole physics, there is a very special black, null manifold, namely the event horizon. The event horizon of a black hole is a null. Notice that in the special case of the Schwarzschild black hole, this null manifold wasn't any old null manifold. It was the event horizon. Okay? <coughs> now, I am going to claim and show you self-consistently by the end of these lectures that this null manifold in the matrix that we're going to study will continue to be the event horizon of the matrix we're going to study. Yes? Is it important that you have trapping around this? Trap surface? Or could you do this for any surface of your This is going to be actually the physical event horizon, not some apparent horizon. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now there also will be apparent horizons in this setup. They will deviate from the event horizon in my context only by distance one by. So they will be there. I suppose it's important. I, yeah. They will be there. Okay. Now let me I I I have to give you the argument by the end of the next lecture, the real argument. Uh, but let me tell you the flavor of the argument, just so that you uh, you more or less believe. You see, there is a mathematical characterization of event horizons in general relativity. Which is the point. Suppose you have a space time that settled down, settles down at late times, so it's a special case, it settles down at late times to a stationary black hole. Or maybe a collection of stationary black holes. Okay? Uh, then we know what the event horizon is of these stationary black holes in late days. It's the obvious short horizon. The event horizon of the whole space time is the unique null manifold which agrees with the known event horizon of these black holes at late times. This is a complete mathematical characterization of an event horizon. Now what I will show you by the end of these lectures is that all our space times uh, await some equations of motion which plausibly has all of them settling down into one or maybe more uh, black holes at late times. And I'm going to show you that well, the, and then it will be manifest that this null manifold for the late time black holes agrees with the event horizon. And therefore this null manifold is the, is the solution to that mathematical problem. It's a null manifold which agrees with the correct event horizon of the black holes in late times. Okay? So to make this argument completely clear, I'm going to have to explain the equations of motion that we're going to see in this lecture and show it. Say a little more after we see these equations of motion, but that's the flavor of the thing. Therefore, we conclude that this surface, rho equals 1, in the matrix of interest, okay, uh, rho equals 1 uh, is going to be the event horizon. Now, why is this of interest? Again, I said this in the last lecture. But this is of interest for the following reason. In solving Einstein's equations, you can have um, two different standards. Okay, in solving Einstein's equations in a context with black holes, you have two different uh, standards of success. One is to solve the equations everywhere. But in a way, you're never really going to do that because you run into singularities. But okay, well, that could be one step. Solve the equations everywhere. There's another lower standard, which is solve the equations only to the exterior of the event horizon of the solutions. Okay? The second thing is a consistent thing to do, because regions behind the event horizon are causally disconnected from regions outside the event horizon. So you know, if a dragon starts flying behind the horizon, event horizon at some point, you'll never know, because it's causally disconnected from, from where you are. So, no matter what happens behind the 
event horizon that you can reliably establish that it is behind the event horizon. It's irrelevant for predicting the outside. It's very relevant for predicting what will happen if you are stupid enough to try to jump into the black hole, but that's not my game. I'm only going to try to predict the outside of the event horizon. Okay? So for that purpose, I only need to solve Einstein's equations in the region rho theta by 1. Actually, as it turns out, what we will do is to solve Einstein's equations in a thickness 1 by d around rho equals 1 and everywhere. This is very important because, you see, this metric here, the same logic that tells you that the metric becomes very near flat space when rho is more than 1 by d larger than 1, tells you that this metric becomes really crazy when rho is more than 1 by d less than 1. Okay? And uh, uh, controlling this metric in that region would be very tough. We're not going to try it and we don't need it. Is this clear? By the way, this technique, this tactic of solving Einstein's equations on the outside event horizons is used routinely in numerical general. You see, they only solve the regions they need to solve, and they stop solving once they're pretty sure they're inside the equations. Which is good, because you know, they won't be able to handle the scene. Okay. So, yes? So, if I look at the original case, I would have said that what you, uh, what you described as rho equals one is the future event horizon. Yes. <clears throat> your discussion, you're talking about a dynamical situation. Are you really able to go right back to where the horizon forms, where it shrinks, where it forms? Well, you know, if you've got some sort of collapse right. to form a black hole, oh, uh, we wouldn't, nothing I'm saying would be able to control that. Okay. Okay. It's going to be a little like you You're looking at situations where there is an event horizon all the time. Right? Yeah. Looking at such Okay? Uh, there's a separate question of how the black hole level actually forms. That's beyond our current approach. That's an issue. Could well be that black hole formation is also simpler. Uh, that could be. But that's not what we mean. Okay. Um, great. So now that we've got, you see, now what do we conclude? We conclude something very important. The thing we've concluded today is uh, if I want to solve Einstein's equations in this whole space time, uh, with the standards I set myself, I only have to set, solve it in the outside and in this little region around the event. But the outside is solved because Einstein's equations are automatically solved because the uh, because flat space is an excellent solution. We can come back to this actually. We'll do even better. Uh, we we solve Einstein's equations even better at first order in this small parameter as we go. Okay, but we start with Einstein's equations just solved outside rows. All we need to worry about is that little region around rho equals 1 of thickness 1 by d where everything is interesting and Einstein's equations are not, not obviously so. Is this clear? Then in the last lecture, I focused on that little thing, little, that little slab. And I evaluated Einstein's equations in that little slab. I told you the naive expectations which are correct naive expectations, would have you expect that the metric that if you evaluated the curvature, you would get d squared. Simply because Einstein's equations are two derivatives, and things are varying over length scale one by d. And that is correct. If you evaluate it for a generic uh, metric of this form, you get d squared. However, if the following two equations are obeyed, del squared of 1 by rho to d minus 3 is equal to 0, and del dot u is equal to 0, then the d square terms vanish. And Einstein's equations, the, the right hand side of Einstein's equations only ordered d rather than order d square. Now, why is this important? This is important because this observation tells us that we now have a plausible starting point for a perturbative expansion of true solutions to Einstein's equations. Let me explain, let me explain uh, what I mean. Okay? Um, suppose I take this starting point and I call it the zero component, G0 mu. I've already solved Einstein's equations to one order better than nine. 
Okay, and some right hand side of Einstein's equations is already rather than this way. So I want to do better. And now when I solve Einstein's equations on the right hand side of Einstein's equations will be order one rather than this. So what should I do? So I do the following. <coughs> I add g1 mu with an explicit one by d. Okay? And I try to choose g1 mu so that Einstein's equations will be solved. So the right hand side of Einstein's equations will be order one. Now, because the addition is small, when I evaluate Einstein's equations, I can linearize with this g1. Okay? So what I'm going to get is whatever Einstein's equations evaluate to and g naught mu nu. But we see that that's order one by d. Sorry, that's order d. Plus, I'll get some linearized stuff. So one by d times whatever Einstein's equations evaluate to on g1 in a linearized fashion. But we've already seen what that should be because Einstein's equations are two derivative. Everything in the game is going to vary on that scale one by d. So this should be a part of d squared. But d squared divided by d is d. And so this is the same order as this. And therefore, it's consistent to try to correct Einstein's equations, uh, try to correct our solution in this way, and to try to choose g1 so that the linearized Einstein's equations acting on g1 cancel the order d part of what we had from the zeroth order answers. Is this clear? Is the strategy clear? Excellent. So now I'm going to try to implement this program. Um, I'll give you a little, just a little flavor of the technicalities. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to implement this program and see what, what we get. Okay? So, when you actually want to implement things, you have to think. Okay? Um, so, to start with, there are two or three things that you have to think of. The first thing is that when you want to solve Einstein's equations, if you want to get an answer rather than a class of answers, you need to carefully fix the square root. Okay. The second thing is something about perturbation theory that you have to keep in mind. And that's this. You see, if you need perturbation theory to find a unique solution, that's very easy. But if you need if you perturbation theory to find a manifold of solutions labeled by a parameter, then in the perturbative process, there are two kinds of things that perturbation theory can do. The first kind of thing is correct your solution. And the second kind of thing is to move you on the manifold of zeroth order, on the manifold of zeroth order uh, solutions that you wanted to look at, look, look for. Okay. So just to say that, uh, 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 just 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 to say that another way. Um, suppose you start trying to do perturbation theory to look for solutions labeled by let's say some parameter. Let's say in this case it was u. Okay, now two different. Suppose I start with a u mu and you start with another u mu that differs from my u mu by one by one. Okay, um, this will lead to this will give us equivalence classes of solutions. You see, my u mu plus a one by the correction that undoes your u mu will be the same as your u. So to have a clear starting point in perturb for perturbation theory, <coughs> I need to specify the square, which solution I'm looking at in a manner that's not just ordered, you know, leading order D, but precise. Okay. What I, what I mean, what that means to say is that I need to tell you if I want to do perturbation theory around around these solutions, I need to tell you exactly what I mean by U and exactly what I mean by U. Okay? That our metric reduces to this metric at leading order 1 by d already tells me what I mean by u mu and rho at leading order 1. But it doesn't tell me what the what possible correction. Okay? So let's fix all these opinions. This, by the way, is related to what people call a frame change in hydrodynamics for people who follow the fluid gravity. I need to specify what u means and what, whether I'm working lambda frame or a half frame, what exactly I mean by Okay, it's the same, same issue. Now, in this context, there is a very natural way of uh, 
of uh, fixing ambiguities in in raw energy. We've already seen the natural thing to do for raw. We think that at the zero order solution, in the zero order solution, the surface rho equals one is a null manifold. And I am going to choose perturbation theory. I'm going to choose my definition of rho, order by order and one by d, to ensure that this lovely property of the zero order solution is exact at every order. Okay? So I will tune my definition of rho to make sure that rho equals one is always a null manifold. Order by order and the one by d. Okay. So this is first prescription. Now I need something similar to say about u in order to give it a clear definition. And that something similar about u um, that I'm going to choose as the following. Let me look at g mu nu n mu, where g once again is the full metric. Okay? So I'm going to raise n mu, not with eta, which would just give me n mu with an upper index, but with g mu. And let me do that. I'm going to be doing this at rho equals 1. Okay? So at rho equals 1, this g mu nu was eta mu nu. Minor uh, uh, n mu minus u u mu n mu minus u mu. I need to check the sign. Okay. Uh, at the one. Okay, um, so this with this gives me n mu. This with this gives me one, but then a minus n mu and plus mu. Okay, so minus n mu <coughs> plus mu. Okay, which is equal to u. So what have we seen? We've seen that u mu is the vector such that when you raise the normal using the true metric, you get u. But this question of what is the vector such that when you raise the normal using the true metric, the, the, the vector that you get by raising the normal using the true metric, it has a name. It's called the generator of the electrolyzer. You know, the electrolyzer can be is foliated by a subset by a congruence of null geodesics. And if you take the uh, if you raise the normal to the event horizon, you get the tangent vector to the local null geodesic of that. Okay? So, what we've seen is that this u mu that we had in our formula has a very nice geometric interpretation of the u mu is the generator of the event horizon on the event horizon. Okay? This property we will demand is true on this. Okay? We will choose our definition of u mu so that such that this beautiful geometrical property is true order by order the one way. <laughs> okay, two more uh, detailed and things like this that I have to go through before we start. This is. Um, the second thing has to do with the choice of gauge, choice of points. Okay? Something I noticed is that my zero order metric was written as eta mu nu plus h mu nu. h mu nu was this. And h mu nu satisfied the property h mu alpha o alpha was equal to zero. But the contraction is with eta. This is obvious, right? This is simply the statement that I wrote now. Uh, I'm going to choose my coordinate system by the requirement that this is true. This is a set of D conditions, which, which is basically a choice of D coordinates. Okay? Once I've done this, I can expand my metric, my unknown H1 metric as follows. Okay, see. The point of this expansion it goes as follows. You see, a zero, we, we're working in a space with nice, uh, uh, nice Lorentz invariants in d plus one, in d dimensions. 
But a zero dollar answer has two distinguished vectors, n mu and u mu. These two vectors for solving for physics around the zero dollar answer breaks this, effectively breaks the SOD in reference to SOD minus two in reference. Okay? So, what I'm going to do in my solving, and I'll explain that a little more, is to work in a sort of basis which keeps the remaining S of D minus 2 invariance manifest. What that means is this. Okay, what that means is this. Firstly, let me define P mu nu, which is a quantity that will occur often, which is eta mu nu minus n mu n nu plus u mu u mu. This is the projector of the to the two plane spanned by n and u. Okay? And then, if I write out the most general metric at any given point, just the decomposition of tangent frames, uh, the most general g mu nu, let's call it h1 mu nu, can be written as, for instance, hs o O M O N plus O M V H N V plus O N H M V plus H T M N plus one by e minus three that's the convention H T R P N. Now, this is the most general structure that, that could appear in the metric, provided this choice of gauge is satisfied. You see, I had two special vectors. So without this choice of gauge, I could have made other common, I could have used this two, I could have called these two special vectors O and N, for instance. And I could have added down, for instance, that was like O, M, O, N, N, N. Another term that was N, 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 N or n dot v. <clears throat> okay? These terms all go away because while o is orthogonal to o, n is not orthogonal. Okay? In this expansion, this quantity here is a vector, by which I mean uh, a quantity with an index such that the projector acting on this quantity is zero. It's a vector in the plane orthogonal to the u, u n. This quantity here is a tensor, two indices, once again orthogonal to this u n. So the projector acting on either of the indices of the tensor is it. Okay? So all I've done is taken a d-dimensional tensor and decomposed it into d minus 2 and 2, and then also put my gauge condition. Is this clear? Yes. This is the gener uh, generalization of tensor plantarizing more than four dimensions. It's generalization of what? Of tensor standards. No doubt. Yes. Uh, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's, yes, it's a convenient basis along which I'm going to do. Yeah. So we have two now vectors describing the rise of the, the N and the U. Uh -huh. and so the, the a, N and U are not should be interchanged them. So N, U, N, U. Because we N have and U are not now. N dot N is 1. U dot U is minus 1. Then you could make two null vectors which are basically O and the other guy. They are, they are o is N minus 1. Square is minus 1. What? The flag, U squared. U squared is minus one. one in the flag. Yes. But in the curve matrix should be zero. Curve matrix presumably zero, yes. Zero on the horizon. Yes, it's zero on the horizon. Yes. Zero on the horizon, yes. 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 And this is P is the projection of the D minus two flag spheres. Yeah, you are foliating your space time by... Now, but, but, but let, let me just be clear. My projector is always a projector in flat space. Okay? So I'm thinking of N and U as one form fields in flat space. My projector is projector orthogonal to the plane in flat space. The whole point of this exercise is to create a metric in terms of geometrical data that lives in flat space. Because we're soon going to see that we're going to get an equation for things moving in flat space. Okay? Great. Thank you. So we don't have any other, other terms <coughs> consistent with that one choice. This is the most general form of the metric. So what 
we need to do to solve for the metric? We need to solve for two, what I'm going to call scalar functions. One vector function and one tensor function. Okay? And first order and perturbation tensor. Is this clear? Okay. Now, actually, there's one further technicality which I think I'm going to just not talk about it until somebody else. I'm just going to go on. Somebody asked me actually earlier. Hopefully, nobody will catch it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's one, one more thing I should be saying about how the thing is how, how u is extended off the memory. Let me see. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, it's just, just it's actually important. You see, I my metric, my zero order class of metrics was defined by this row surface, sorry, by, by this row function and the u function. Now the row function we have already shown, okay, we have already shown is completely defined by the geometrical nature of the surface row equals one. Order by the order in a Taylor series expansion. Okay, in the one-way expansion. <coughs> so the data in the row function is not like a function in space time. It's the real data is the a manifold. A codimension is the shape of a codimension one manifold in space. <coughs> Some manifold in space. Okay? On the other hand, for my u function, in this way of looking at it, I still have a u function in all of space. However, you see, this u function is a smooth function. So if my Taylor series expanded it in a power series in rho minus 1, I would get um is equal to um at rho equals 1 plus rho minus 1 times something, and so on. Now, as I explained to you, I am, we are only interested in solving Einstein's equations over regions of rows that are rho minus times on the one way. So this Taylor series expansion of u is small compared to the starting. Okay? This takes us back to a comment I tried with incompetency to make at the beginning of this lecture, which is that if I have two different starting points for perturbation theory, that differ only at some leading order in your perturbative expansion, they actually stay the same starting point. Because you can fix up the differences between the two starting points by corrections in the next order. Okay? So, the data that actually labels starting points for perturbation theory is not u in all of space time. It's only u on the membrane. I'm going to use the word membrane for the co-dimension one surface rho equals one. So, all we really need to specify is u on the membrane. But, you know, if you actually want to write down formulas, uh, you need u everywhere. So in order to, in order to make our perturbation theory uh, completely explicit, what we do is specify a rule for computing u away from the membrane, given u on the membrane. Roughly, in different papers, we can use different rules, <coughs> depending on convenience for that particular calculation. But roughly, you can use the rule n dot del of u is equal to u. So that once you know u on the membrane, you just parallel transport it off along, uh, along normals to the row surfaces. Okay, yes? Yes, the choice of the, what, what, how to extend you will include nothing. You see, two different choices differ at first subleading order in one way. If you use one choice, I use another. Our first order corrections will differ precisely by that amount. So as to give us the same metric at first order. And then our second order corrections will differ precisely by that amount, so as to give us the same metric by that amount. Now this is true because I have given you a precise definition of e, If I hadn't given you a precise definition of u, you might have ended up computing one solution, I might have ended up computing another solution. Because we've got a manifold of solutions. Both of us would have found the full class of solutions, but with different labels. That, even that is not going to be a problem, because I've given you a clear definition of u and a clear, clear definition of u. So we will all agree on completely. And then that's all this. And this we've checked explicitly. We've used in different papers. We've used different things and always got the same. Okay. Yeah. The covariant derivative is always taken to go into the flat space. Flat. So your surface has no surface gravity related to the m supposed to be u. Well, what surface gravity? It has an extrinsic curvature. Yeah. We have to. We have to. 
you have an extrinsic uh, uh, yeah, uh, we have the surface itself, let's forget you, the surface itself has an extrinsic curvature that will play an important role in Bonfire. So, yes, but I won't call it surface gravity as a Thank as you. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, other questions about that? Excellent. So now they're all set. We just grind the crack. Okay? So now what we do is to take <coughs> this expansion and plug it into they put that into G. So take our metric to be G0 plus 1 by D times G1. G1 is this concretely, and we plug it into Einstein's equations. Now, you might think that what we're going to land up with is some god awful mess because Einstein's equations are partial differential equations. As we've seen, in order to get out of D squared, we only need to take a linearized part of G1. So we get some simplification. Einstein's equations will become linear partial differential equations. But uh, as all of you know, in linear partial differentials, equations are difficult to solve. The great thing here, as in fluid gravity, is we don't get linear partial differential. We get linear ordinary differential. Why is that? We get linear ordinary differential equations, roughly speaking, for the following Let us remember why we said this guy here was ordered d squared. We said it was ordered d squared because Einstein's equation is two derivative, and things vary on length scale one by <coughs> but remember the structure of a metric. Things vary on length scale 1 by d in only one direction. Namely the direction of rho. We have ensured that all other variations, like the shape of the membrane, the velocity field, is all on scale 1. There is only one direction in which the variation happens fast. Namely on length scale 1 by d. And that is in the direction along n b. Okay? So while when we plug in this guy into Einstein's equations, we get derivatives in all terms, the only terms that will contribute are all the d squared. Are those terms that involve derivatives with respect to rho? Okay? So these equations, when you do this plugging in, become very simple. At each point on the membrane, at each x mu, what you get is a set of ordinary dimension equations. Is this clear? In order to solve these ordinary differential equations, it's sort of convenient to move to new coordinates. To move to a coordinate, you know, everything interesting is happening in a, uh, in a region of rho around 1 of order 1 by d. Let's blow that region up into the size of order 1. So we define r as rho minus 1 by d. And work with the coordinate r. Okay, so we're going to a point of memory and blow it up. Okay? And what we do this coordinate system now, we just take this thing into Einstein's, apply it into Einstein's equations, um, use Mathematica effectively to get to equations, and you get the equations. Okay? And very briefly, um, I'm going to indicate <coughs> roughly the nature of these equations. Okay? And then finally, I, I'll do a couple of things and then you do the answer. Okay. Any questions or comments of the logic? Wait, I will do Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, let me let me get rid of this. This stuff you all know by now. Now, because all our derivatives are only in the row direction, the fact that n and u vary as we move along the membrane doesn't matter. So effectively our differential equations are, have SOD minus 2 invariants. So the differential equations split up into equations for tensors, equations for vectors, and equations for scales. They linear equations so they cannot mix. Let me show you the equation for the, for the tensors. The effective Einstein equation for the tensor turns, uh, turns out to be this. R e a d uh, e to the power minus r d by d r e to the power r minus 1 uh, d by d r of uh, h m 
n. Uh, into k squared by 2d minus 3 squared uh, plus st a b of r is equal to 0. Okay. This equation gen uh, illustrates the general structure of the equation we get for the equation. The equation always has two parts. There's a piece acting on the unknown, the thing we want to determine, that's HNN. And there's a piece that is on the right hand side. Is equal to this. It's on the right hand side of this equation. This guy on the right hand side of this equation is some function of R that order by order and perturbation theory is something known. It is given in terms of derivatives of the velocity and the shape function. Actually, at first order perturbation theory, this term turns out to be zero. However, the structure of the equation, the density equation, is the same at every order perturbation Every Every order perturbation theory, this part of the equation will not change. What you get is a new function of the right hand side. That's why I've written it down for you in general before telling you that it's easier. Okay? So you've got a simple differential operator acting on an unknown function. Okay? And a, a source on the right hand side of that that is determined by your lower order solutions in terms of derivatives of you know temporal velocity. For instance, had it, had it not, it turns out to be zero, but a term that we could have imagined appearing here would be sigma n, the symmetrized traceless derivative of the velocity. Turns out the coefficient of that is zero at first order, but not a second order. The second order is actually term. terms like this appear. Okay? Now I've got this differential equation. I just look at it. It's a terribly simple differential equation. I solve it by integration. I take this e to the power r on the right hand side and I integrate to get e to the power r minus 1 d by dr hmn times this constant k squared by d. k by the way is the trace of the extrinsic curvature of the membrane. Okay. Uh, is equal to uh, <coughs> integral e to the power r s a b t of r. Okay. Now this integral is a bit imprecise because this integral can be taken, let's say, from some a to r. And I need to know if I want a unique solution. I need to know what a is. Okay. But here physics tells me what what it is. Because if you look at the right hand side, at r equals 0, maybe on the event horizon. Sorry, if you look at the left hand side, at r equals 0 on the event horizon, this quantity vanishes because e to the power 0 minus 1. Therefore, the right hand side must also vanish. Okay? And that happens if I choose a to be 1. There's another way of saying it. Zero. 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 There's another way of saying If I did not choose this to be 1, then when I integrate to the second time, I would get a constant near rho, uh, r equals 1, I get a constant divided by uh, a linear 0, and therefore like that fixing it. So if I didn't choose this to be 0, I would get a solution that was singular at r equals 0. r equals 0 when I bend the right. We are going to demand that we deal with solutions which both the better. So smoothness of the event horizon dictates what this integration constitutes. Then, once I've got this, I take this divide and integrate again. Okay. Now, the second integration constant, I won't go through it in detail because it requires the structure of the S of R. But the second integration constant is also determined in this case. This time by the requirement that my solution decay at infinity. See, I'm going to be looking for solutions that share the property of my zero dollar solution. That is, they rapidly decay to flat space over distance scales large compared to one over d. So r, as r goes to infinity, the solution should decay because that's rho minus one large compared to one over d. That second requirement sets the integration constant of the second integration. Explicitly, hmn is equal to minus integral r to infinity, uh, one by e to the power r minus one, integral 0 to r, I 
should call it something else, right? Uh, uh, e to the power x, s, t, d, b of x, b. So this is a nice explicit formula that gives me the tensor part of the metric in terms of the tensor part of the source. I told you how it works in first order perturbation theory, but the same thing works in tenets. But uh, works in every order perturbation theory. What changes is the nature of the source. The first order things are very simple. In fact, the source is zero. The first order we just get zero. That's pretty nice. That, that, that's just a coincidence. Doesn't, doesn't persist. Okay, so far so good. The 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 uh, program of solving for this uh, for uh, for this for this metric seems to be proceeding nicely. However, the really interesting thing is going to happen now. Let's now move to the big question. Okay. Let's try to determine, uh, you have to remember what I called it was HV of A, the vector field, the unknown vector field. Okay. Now, when you try to determine the unknown vector field, you run into what seems to be an algebraic problem. And the thing that seems to be an algebraic problem is the following. You see, although we have only one vector unknown, we have two vector equations. Because you can take Einstein equations along the n vector direction, or Einstein's equations along the u vector direction. There are two Einstein equations, there's only one unknown. It's two vector equations, one unknown, doesn't mean we're dealing with an inconsistent set of equations. Of course not. See, these Einstein equations, they're the most beautiful equations written down by human beings ever. They're not inconsistent. Okay? Why are they inconsistent? Okay? <coughs> They, they now are inconsistent because of the beautiful property of Einstein's equations. And this beautiful property of Einstein's equations is the following. That if you are solving for equations in evolution in one parameter, in our case the parameter is a row, then there are two lo logically different kinds of equations. There are the constraint equations, okay, which are, in this case, are Einstein's equations, EMN, let's say EMN equals 0, uh, times GN alpha. P times NP. The constraint equations, that is, the equations that you get with one, with one or more indices dotted with the one form dual to the slices that you're evolving along. And the dynamic equations, which are the other ones. Now, this beautiful property of Einstein's equations that we had occasion to discuss before is that if the constraint, if the dynamic equations are made everywhere, and the constraint equations are weighed on one slice, then the constraint equations are weighed on every other slice. Which, in algebraic terms, means that these two equations are not independent of each other. A derivative of one gives you the other, roughly speaking. Okay? So in order to solve these equations, all we have to do is to solve the dynamical equation everywhere and the constraint equation on one slice. Okay? So let's first write down the constraint equation. Drops out. And we get an equation on the source. 
still. This is equal to zero. Now remember, the source term was some given set of derivatives on the velocities and shape fields. So now we say that for Einstein's equations to be obeyed, it's not enough to choose the corrections to the metric. We have to do that. But in addition to doing that, we need a constraint to the starting point of perturbation. The constraint on the starting, on the starting point of perturbation e is expressed in the vector sector by the requirement that this quantity <coughs> vanishes. Okay? And uh, uh, let me say explicitly, um, let me say explicitly what, what that evaluates to. Uh, explicitly evaluates to the equation del square u a by kappa minus del a kappa by kappa uh, plus u c uh, kappa c a uh, minus u dot del u uh, is sorry kappa is the extrinsic extrinsic curvature trace of the extrinsic curvature and k a c is the full extrinsic This whole thing projected orthogonal with a projected acting on it. Okay, projected orthogonal to unity. Thank you. Okay. The whole thing only in the orthogonal directions. Because it's a vector equation. Okay. Now when you repeat the same thing in the scalar set. Okay, uh, in addition, you have to go ahead and solve the vector equation. It's sort of like solving the tensor equation. You're not going to go through all this. You find it in my favorites. Simple stuff. Okay? You solve for the effect on you. Then you move to the scalar sector. When you move to the scalar sector, you find you have one more constraint. In this case, leading all in perturbation theory, this constraint turns out to be something we already knew. You simply get del dot u. So the thing that we use to start out our perturbative analysis comes back to this. And that's it. So, and then you solve for the scalar unknowns as well. You get a unique solution. So what have we accomplished? What we have accomplished is the following. Once we have all these conditions, that, that is we plug in the, so, the, the functions, the unknown functions, as functions of R. We now have our first correction. That first correction, when, in, when accompanied by the zero third answer, allows us to satisfy Einstein's equations so that on the right hand side of Einstein's equations, instead of getting b squared, instead of getting d, we get order one. But not without a price. Only if these two equations are away. Same logic. Okay. Now, what you know? What, what are these conditions? What, what do we make of them? If you think about it, these conditions is what you should have worked. Why is that? You see. At zero total perturbation theory, what we did was to try to get a solution of Einstein's equations that was specified by a shape of, a, of the membrane and a velocity field. But both the shape of the membrane and the velocity field were completely free functions of space and time. Now, you shouldn't find solutions to Einstein's equations that have free functions of time. Because the whole point in life of equations of motion is to tell you what happens in the future once, once you're told what happens now. You should find free functions of space. But time evolution should be determined. Otherwise, what are the equations of the motion doing? Okay? Uh, and leading order, we found, you know, it's a bit wild, right? We found solutions to three functions of time. But that was because we were working at leading order. Once we plug this into the first order equations, we found that it didn't work. That you couldn't take that leading order thing and 
systematically extend the uh, solution to Einstein's equations order by order, one by d, unless there was an integrable decondition fashion. Now, let's do some talk. How many variables do we have? So I'm going to count functions of d minus 1 variables. The shape of the membrane is one function of d minus 1. <coughs> okay? The velocity field is d minus 1 functions of uh, <coughs> a d minus 1 variables. It's d minus 1 rather than d, but well, d minus 2. d minus 2 functions of d minus 1 variables. You might have thought it was d minus 1 because it's a vector index, but u squared is 0. That's all it's just in a u squared is minus 1. That means it's actually d minus 2 functions of d minus 1. Remember that the submanifold is d minus 1. Is this clear? So the total number of variables in our problem was equal to d minus 1. Okay? How many equations do we have? Well, that's d minus 2 equations. Why is it d minus 2 equations? It's d minus 2 equations because this was a vector, so it should have been d minus 1, but we had a protector orthogonal to u, so that's d minus 2. And then there's one more, plus 1. So number of equations equals number of variables. So now we see that these words that I tried to put about time dependence, blah, 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 have become real. Because if you've got as many equations as variables, there is a good chance that you've got a good initial value problem. And therefore, the present will, will determine the future. We will see at least in the linearized approximation that this is the case. Okay? So these equations define a good initial value problem. Okay? Now what is this an I can think one of the done What is this an initial value problem? Let's say the initial value problem. In the next time we will solve this initial value problem for various situations. We get more intuition. But uh, uh, and we get more intuition for various <coughs> nature of these equations. But um, uh, by the way, some of you who know hydrodynamics already see that these equations are very hydrodynamic. Some of you can identify a uh, viscosity and various other things. But we'll, we'll look at that. Okay, but, uh, um, but what I want to say, just leave you with is the following. What is the nature of the, the, the dynamics? What are the variables of the problem? The shape of a co-dimension one membrane living in flat space and a velocity field on this co-dimension one membrane. Okay? Well, then there are some equations on the shape expressed in terms of intrinsic curvatures and on, on the velocity. So we've got this membrane pro propagated around in flat space uh, according to some equations of motion. Once we solve these equations of motion, we have, for each solution to these equations of motion, we have a solution of Einstein gravity, the, the motion of a, of, a, of a black hole in large Okay? In the next lecture, we will explore the nature of these equations, find solutions, try to understand them better. Uh, for that.